Phantom Liberty added 9 new gigs that take place in and around Dogtown. Each of these are bigger, bolder, and pack a lot more secrets and details than those from the base game. So, in this video, we're going to be delving into the various shards, subtext, and wildly different outcomes for each gig before adding them to the overall tier list. This is going to be one crazy deep dive, so let's jump right in. Up first, the Dogtown Sates gig explores the prospect of a medical clinic situated in the heart of Dogtown, working free for the impoverished citizens, but having to make some questionable choices in order to sustain itself. And when one of those results in the disappearance of a scavenger named Gaspar Yankovic, the clinic is invaded and its ripper dock held hostage by scabs. Of course, Mr. Hans, actually having a modicum of empathy, doesn't want Dogtown's disadvantaged to completely run dry of healthcare options, sending us in to save the dock and Anderson. Now, this clinic operates out of a church, run by priest Odell Blanco, who found just preaching words of God wasn't cutting it in Dogtown. Meeting him outside, we'll learn that the clinic is dealing pretty much entirely in scavenged second-hand implants, like this guy, who's experiencing problems with a knee since it was originally calibrated for women. Odell will explain that a scav named Nika came here with her goons, and in a rare display of mercy for the scavs, actually allowed the patients to walk out. Barguest are doing nothing about this whole thing, and Odell suspects Hanson's right hand, Bennett, already took a bribe from the scabs. We'll learn in the Run This Town side quest that yes, Bennett is absolutely one for taking bribes. We can learn more about Odell when heading inside. He doesn't regret lending out the church as a clinic one bit, but the constant suffering he bears witness to daily appears to have caused him something of a crisis of faith. He still wants to help, but with more than just words and prayers. He's also not a pushover, since when a morphine slash fant addict named Greg Wilson, one of the 11 cyber junkies begs Odell for morphine, under the pretense of it being for his kid, Odell is having none of it, redirecting the guy instead to a proper rehab centre in Night City. Clearly a responsible guy to take over this place, should Anderson, well, we'll get to that. Taking out these scavs though, there's a few more things, like their general disapproval and fear of getting sick for being at this clinic, even though these guys literally carve people up for a living. But in a satisfying twist of fate, we begin to see that the ripper Anderson has been turning the tables on these gutter dwelling scum. See, this guy, found down here, has a metal arm, which he received used from some other wearer. In fact, you could almost say he got the thing second hand. Their joke, not mine. But if we don't kill these scavs immediately, we'll hear a convo where they realise it's actually the very same arm that belonged to one of their scav tombs. Indeed, Anderson has been obtaining most of his implants from any patients that just don't make it, disrespecting the dead for the sake of the still living. And by reading some of the terminals, it's also explained that this isn't Anderson's first case of morally questionable actions. The reason he's wound up in Dogtown is because he's wanted elsewhere, committing some form of atrocity apparently at the hospital he worked at in NC. And now, not even medical charities will donate to the Haven Clinic as they just can't be seen endorsing his actions. So instead, secondhand meds and implants is what it'll have to be. On here as well is a list of all the patients who died following complications. With Gaspar Yankovic, mysteriously lacking explanation. Looks like we'll have to hear that from the mouth of Anderson himself, which currently has Nika's gun pointed at it when we enter the office. You! Off your ass! Where's Gaspar? Now, you probably don't recognise her voice because it sounds, well, nothing like Lazelle, but fun fact to Baldur's Gate fans, Nika is also voiced by Deborah Wilde, who of course is best known for playing everyone's favourite Githyanki in the game of the year. And from this point onwards in the quest, there are three main outcomes. We can A, shoot and kill Nika, and I mean realistically she is just another scav, I killed like 10 of her group just coming down here, and Nika also has a shard on her body, explaining that Gaspar had ordered a ton of drugs looks like from a dealer who's also hoping to track the guy down. I guess neither of them ever will, but we can by reading Anderson's laptop. Turns out he recently set up a cold storage area for keeping bodies and implants on ice. Opening the door and crossing the hall, we'll find none other than the body of Gaspar, lethally injected with morphine by Anderson himself. Quizzing why he did such a thing, Anderson says the guy came in high off his nuts, fell into a coma, and would have slowly died anyway. He made the hard call to just hasten the inevitable and let Gaspar's still 
malfunctioning implants be useful, not telling Nika for fear of his life, or rather the welfare of his patients, so he says. Patients that now stand a far better chance with the clinic reopen and Anderson alive. We'll even unlock him as a ripper for ourselves. But of course, this gig can wind up completely different. By refusing to shoot Nika, nor interfering whilst she bashes Anderson's brains in, the unlikable but positively influential doctor will be killed. We can open the fridge, allowing Nika to mourn, and she'll leave the clinic in peace, only now ripperless. On Anderson's body, we can get a little more info on his previous misdeeds at the hospital. Presumably his wife, or possibly sister, Tara, was questioned for five hours as to his whereabouts, and the only thing he ever tells her is I'm sorry, purely an indication that he was alive. Johnny will acknowledge then that whatever Anderson's choice is, the guy was kind of screwed when it comes to doing the right thing. Guy had questionable ethics, but what's a doctor to do in Dogtown? was a lose-lose situation from the get-go. In this timeline, Odell resumes control of the clinic, and instead of a ripper doc, we'll unlock another med vendor. The place receives a temporary boom from selling off implants. After all, nobody's left who can install them, but Odell fears the place can now only last a few more weeks. If asked how he feels after losing his tomb Anderson, he'll simply say that the two were never tombs. Understandable, I can't imagine a priest finding it easy to get along with a guy who desecrates the dead, no matter how nobly. Though interestingly, despite utterly failing the assignment here, Mr. Hands will still pay us in full, as we dealt with the scav situation regardless. Hopefully he'll offer more financial aid to the clinic too, because this place seems totally screwed now. There is however a final outcome, one which winds up best for both parties. Again, we don't kill Nika, but we also don't let her kill Anderson, instead convincing him to give up the body, opening the fridge with his keycard. Whilst obviously furious at Anderson's disregard for Gaspar, I think deep down Nika does acknowledge that revenge will be pointless at this point. Her brother was dying anyway, and now the best she can do is take him to the eastern edge of Dogtown for burial. And heading there ourselves a while later, we can exchange one final farewell with Nika, stood over Gaspar's grave, adorned with a slaughtermatic. Me and the scavs don't exactly get along. Be good to keep our ways separate. I won't go looking for you, that's for sure. I'll leave you alone. Mm. I am already. Ooh, that's sad. I mean, still, Scav, who I don't normally feel sorry for, but this time, I just can't help it. And personally, even though Nika may go on amongst legions of Scavs to murder innocents and harvest their implants, this outcome just feels the most complete, with everyone involved getting an ending? Not a happy ending, but a continuation, let's say. Now, strictly speaking, every gig in Dogtown compared to the base game should be solid S tiers, but that doesn't really differentiate them. And since this is one of the simpler Dogtown games, Gigs, let's award it a very, very high A+. Up next, we're heading into Voodoo Boy territory up in Luxor Heights, and all the different Voodoo Boy leaders appear to be holed up along this same strip. We've got Slider down at the end, Io Zarin in the middle, and Milko Alexis at the northern end. Our target for this gig, whom we're taking out on behalf of Indira Baratza, a woman getting blackmailed by the Voodoos with the threats of remotely shutting down her implants. Indira is a corpo technical employee, and Mr. Hands is something of a corpo fixer, so it was turned to as a way out, though getting to Milko will be no easy feat. He not only has other voodoos guarding him, but also has an army of robots. But first, let's deal with the other voodoos and see what we can learn. Looks like this particular group have an under-the-table deal going on with a plant at Bargest, who lifts shipments of chrome and delivers it to them. These frequent deliveries cause a little bit of infighting, but for the most part it runs as a fairly smooth operation. And in fact, taking a right just before the room with the giant robots, we can actually come face to face with Kyle. The Voodoo's bar guest contacts. Whether alive or dead though, can depend. One time he was fine, another he'd been killed for some reason by a Voodoo boy. He does have a shard where we learn he's essentially lifting a ton of gear from bar guests warehouses and bribing one of his colleagues to cover for him, though it does look like he's gonna wind up caught sooner or later, given that the Voodoo's are now demanding more and more gear from him than he can safely take in one go. If we find him alive though, he can actually massively help us out, for a small bribe or a punch to the face that is. Doing this 
this, Kyle will offer to overload the disc arrays in the server room where the robots are kept, allowing us, during this big boss battle that's going to ensue, to shoot the boxes and cause a ton of electrical damage to the robots. It's very useful, especially against the weaker minions, so I'd recommend having him do it. But before heading in there, there's some more to discover in the main spa. For instance, in this little side room off from the big statue area, we have a terminal discussing the shared storage area over in Slider's hideouts, which the guys down here are also keeping stuff in. Apparently, Slider must be blind or stupid to grant them access to that, uh, and well, that description is half accurate, he is blind. Though, fortunately for us, Slider's key is left on the side here, and you'll definitely want to pick that up, as then, when you meet Slider later in the main story, you'll be able to access his stash and obtain the iconic revolver Grigri, which I looked at alongside the others in Revolver's Ranked. Also, just up the stairs from the entrance on a terminal is an email thread from a VDB who's clearly spent too much time on the FF06B5 subreddit, with this wild theory that they're occupying two spas in Luxor Heights because of the water elements which connects to the net running ice baths and is a relevant conspiracy somehow. I mean, I'd figured it was just up and out of the way of Barghest and the Scavs, but who knows, really? But with everything relevant looked into back here, it's time to face the robots. Most of them are easy to dispatch, it's more their numbers that are formidable, though the big fella in the middle with his big health bar is quite a bit tougher. Again, exploding the boxes is very useful, and with the bot down, we can loot probably the best smart pistol in the game, the iconic Chow Ogu. And coming down to the room below, we'll finally be face to face with Milko Alexis. But of course, there's one more twist to come in the form of an undercover Netwatch agent, Alan Noel. This guy's been piggybacking off of Milko for months under the pretense of being his net security, all with the goal of locating the people at the head of the wider Voodoo Boy operation. Corpos can comment that Undercover isn't Netwatch's style, to which he'll explain they literally can't turn VDBs on one another. They're all just too internally loyal. And we can also name drop Bryce Mosley here, who we meet back in the main game. Alan's reaction's somewhat different there, depending on what became of Mosley. But ultimately, this comes down to one of two choices. Complete the mission, as instructed, kill Milko and by extension Alan, save Indira, at least on this occasion, but in Alan's own words, Milko will just be replaced, and the bribery of Indira will then probably continue. Johnny, the anti-corpo rockaboy terrorist that he is, suggests Alan doesn't care about any of these people and just wants to be employee of the month, but that as the case may be, it's looking like us sowing more chaos won't actually solve anything in the long term. Still, taking him out will get a keycard to escape and his dog tag. Hans will be happy for completing the job, no questions asked, and everything will be okay today. But the significantly better choice, in my opinion, is to look at the bigger picture. Keep Milko alive, and Alan's undercover status is intact. And not only does this leave hope for the future, but immediately upon leaving, Hans will call us once again, expressing approval. Turns out, Alan's not a total shitbag, and made sure Indira was placed on a witness protection list immediately, guarded in both virtual and physical space from any potential assailant. Hopefully now, the only person in the world capable of reaching her would be, well, us, because let's be honest. Additionally, in this scenario, Han stays in good stead with Netwatch for not having his operations disrupt theirs. No world-changing consequences to that, but Han's increasing his power as a fixer is probably no bad thing. On your way out of Milko's room though, don't miss this terminal, although only those with 20 intelligence can hack it, and on there it reads a couple more things. Firstly, Alan is largely the one behind securing Barghest gear to aid the operation, but since Kyle is trying to be careful and not steal too much Barghest stuff at once, Alan has had them resort to straight up hitting airdrops, explaining why we see the VDBs fighting over them at certain times. And possibly this is a clever bid from him to thin their numbers as well. Second is a list of candidates from whom to try and secure cooperation, the priority with which to do so and the suspected difficulty. Clearly, Alan is trying to secure a chokehold on this lot in order to maintain control should things go south. Though whether he's had any success on that, I mean, I kind of doubt that they'd actually cave. Still, looks like leaving Alan to do his thing, he is eventually successful, tracking down whoever is above Milko and crippling the entire operation. And as thanks, Alan will transfer us a bonus 8,000 further down the line. So overall, this turns out to be one of the few choices of these gigs that turn out best for everyone. Our fixer, our clients, Netwatch, and V. So I think between the boss fights and the fact that Netwatch are highlighted once again as probably the most decent corp in the game, I mean, don't get me wrong, they're not perfect, they do carry out what's necessary to them, but they do it in the nicest possible way. And I think ultimately, this gig belongs in the S tier.
When a Zeta Tech convoy gets attacked by the Scavs and a precious prototype stolen, we're sent in to infiltrate their heavily guarded Longshore Stacks base, retrieving both the prototype and the schematics. Heading in here, we can see the Chevalon Emperor Ragnar that got raided, and dotted around this place are a couple shards and a terminal, explaining which storage units they've moved the loot to and how to access it. Firstly, we have containers 21 and 29, both along the back here which we'll need to open up, and the loot inside isn't brilliant, but maybe there's some clothing items that you'll like. Coming through to the back, left of the elevator then, is a locked armory. The code is 2045, and in here are actually some fairly decent weapons. We can also learn that the scavs were in fact planning to scrap the car because of the trackers and whatnot, but too little too late since it's already led us here. We can also learn, disgustingly, that part of the reason the scav chose to hole up in this skyscraper was due to the inclusion of the furnace. Perfect for burning bodies and cooking pizza. Yeah, there's a reason these guys are the scum of the earth. They also have a runner in their ranks named Phil Coke, possibly related to Joanne Coke of Biotechnica. I'd say the two are worlds too many apart to be related, but both do just sound as scummy as each other. And when Phil was asked to hack a guy, he misunderstood and hacked him to pieces. Then we've got some ex-Militech employees who've managed to fall in with this lot, but think themselves above the rest and say that it's hurtful to be called psychos and butchers. So if you choose to join the scavs, that is literally the job description. Now a few of these guys keep mentioning a prisoner, and heading down to the cells, lo and behold, the scavs have captured themselves a Zeta Tech engineer named Hassan, a guy who's about to become our problem because this dude has implanted himself with the prototype we've been sent to recover. How gonk you gotta be to chip yourself with prototype tech? No offense, V. Yeah, to be fair, we don't have a leg to stand on here, and ultimately proceeding with this quest requires us to free Hassan, either by hacking the door or finding a code on a nearby laptop, upon which we can also learn that the scavs tried to ransom this guy back to Zeta Tech, demanding a million eddies from the corporation, but like every customer service email in this world, and the real world, simply getting back automated replies. Though hilariously, this pre-programmed machine does somehow manage to haggle them down to half a million, simply by sending automated replies and making them feel mocked. They've also got contact with the big group of scavs over in Terra Cognita, who are headed this way to collect some of the loot. And in the files here is the cell code. Letting Hassan out and making our way to the exits, we'll first see one of his butchered colleagues, whose implants were extracted just way too forcefully. And Hassan will thank us for saving him from this furnace before retrieving the schematics for the prototype. There's a couple bits and pieces scattered about in the side rooms up here, so worth looking around, but nothing tremendously special. Of course, since there's more scavs headed this way, we instead have to leave via the drawbridge. And it's after crossing this that we're left with the ultimate decision as to how to resolve this gig, something that's becoming a commonplace feature of these. Hassan says he'll be fine from here, leaving us the schematics and promising to deliver the prototype personally after getting it extracted at a ripper, so we can let him do just that. But when Mr. Hands calls, it'll become clear that we've been duped. Hassan ran off with the prototype and was never never seen again. Hans says this failure will be his burden to bear, but does at least pay us in full still. Equally, we can refuse Hassan's request at first, at which point he will come clean with the whole thing. See, Hassan's plan the entire time had been to betray Zeta Tech. Tired of working for the corp, he planned to buy himself a fresh start before trading this immensely valuable thing with a buyer at the stadium. See, this prototype is something that can rival Kuroshi Optics, and the reason he had it implanted was to serve as a bargaining chip of sorts. The buyer would smuggle him across the border, after which Hassan would hand over the chip. Genius, but the problem being that Zeta Tech employed us, and Zeta Tech will want their prototype back. But we can again let him go, this time lying to Hans and saying it was nowhere to be found. He'll say again it's something of a blow to him, but again pay us in full. Releasing a man with an immensely valuable prototype into Dogtown though, well actually it turns out Hassan's plan was flawed from the start. He still connects with his buyer at the stadium bargaining chips still implanted, only to get knocked out cold, the prototype forcibly removed, and we can later find Hassan chilling on a mattress at the bottom of our apartment building. Face covered in bandages, of course. Reduced to nothing in this instance, but another Dogtown lowlife. Back to the choices, though. If you want to instead be a by-the-book stickler, you can just call Mr. Hands and send someone for the schematics and Hassan. He'll be carted off to have it extracted, then probably get executed by Zeta Tech, and will be congratulated on a job 
not well done. However, as with most of these, there is a scenario that does work out best for everyone, including us. Call Mr. Hands, tell him what's up, and convince him to help Hassan out. Getting the implant extracted and returned to Zeta Tech, then letting the guy walk as a gesture of goodwill, to which Hands, recognizing our value, agrees. But in this case, the gig doesn't fully end here. Later, Hassan will send us a text about meeting in Longshore Stacks, triggering the quest Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. We'll find Hassan has established himself fairly well here, better at least than he'd ever have done with his plan, doing essentially the same sort of engineering work he did at Zeta Tech, but at least is free from the oppression of the corp. As thanks then for saving him from the scavs and then from Zeta Tech, he'll have a gift for us, an iconic Kenshin variant named Ambition with the power to blind enemies. This is the first model he made, but there were others for other clients, which we can read about on his laptop. Three were given to Mr. Hans, ex corpo wise and fairest of all fixes, seven to the stadium vendors, great businessmen and swindlers of goods, and nine. Nine guns were given to the soldiers of Bargest, who above all else desire power or money. For within these guns was bound the strength and will to blind each enemy, but they were all of them deceived. For another gun was made. In the land of Dogtown, in a hut of Longshore Stacks, the corpo engineer Hassan forged in secret a master gun one to blind all others. And into this gun he poured his intelligence, his gratitude, and his will for V to dominate all life. One gun to rule them all. Except no, because if you've seen my Pistols Ranked video, you'll know that that gun is pride. Definitely an S tier gig though. I mean, for that Lord of the Rings reference alone, S tier gig. This one is definitely the funniest gig out of these, and quite possibly the funniest in the entire game, in a kind of black comedy in Bruges type style, and involves us breaking into a police station turned drug drop to rescue two utter gonk police officers, Charlie and Bill. See, after getting into business with one of Hanson's men, Dodger, the two find themselves in a spot of bother, so Bill contacted his fiancée Stella, saying, it's really bad, get help. Stella, of course, is voiced by none other than Susie Hunter, aka the Sphere Hunter, and she also confirmed that Stella is the sister of a character from Edge Runners, that being Sasha, who is the focus of the Let You Down prequel music video by David Poshido. Basically, her appearance was inspired by Susie too, so they made them both sisters, though Stella chose the slightly safer lifestyle of a cop and, well, survived. Anyway, to kick this one off, we'll talk with Stella in a car outside who will give us access to the station. This is actually out in Coastview rather than Dogtown itself, but even still is literally right next to the border. Order. Hence, an NCPD station that can fall into trouble with Barghest. And getting inside this place and reading the first terminal, it's clear that this is literally a law enforcement base turned on its head into a hub of criminal activity. We've got Dodger commissioning people to track down Jesse Turner, a junkie who stole from him, and we've also got a cool connection with the previous gig, in the form of Hassan's company expense chart, sent over by the scabs to be cracked. And basically it just says don't spend company money on illegal goods. We also also have an email from 2072, which it turns out is actually when this specific precinct was disbanded, after the entirety of Pacifica decided to riot against any NCPD control. In fact, it was so extreme that all officers were suggested to leave in civilian attire in order to not get killed. Then, finally, we've got an update on Jesse Turner, which turns out Charlie and Bill had arrested, and getting wind Dodger was looking for him brought the guy to this station, hoping for a finder's fee, which ultimately explained explains why they're at this abandoned place at all. So we can find Charlie and Bill down in the basements, and word of warning, I would suggest if you want to have the option to resolve this whole thing peacefully, to approach all of these Barghest soldiers non-lethally, either with takedowns or just fists. Down here then, we've got a soldier attempting to explain to the two cops how to open the door, because they're either even stupider than made out, or possibly a little bit cleverer. Barghest basically have decided it best to keep an eye on them at all times, what with them being cops and all. So, ripping open the door, turns out Charlie and Bill are in one hell of a ridiculous mess. The guy they brought in is dead, and well, maybe it's best if they just explain. Went like this. Choom over here clips Dodger's shit. Hightails it to NC. We catch wind, Dodger's put out a bounty to bag him. Bring back his nose candy. Bump right into him during a routine stop. Dumb fucking luck. Choom was carrying seven ounces of Sin Coke, so we cuffed him. Took him here. Choom swallowed seven whole ounces? That even possible? So we're here, waiting on Dodger, when Bill pops the baggie on the table like it's nothing. 
All of a sudden, this gonk turd yells, fuck you, pigs, and stuffs the bag in his mouth. Could have had a food tube implant? Like a deep, wide throat? Yeah, like the one your mom's got. Fuck you even talking about, Bill. Couldn't get him to just spit it out? We tried to make a trek oh, tr track it, tra f fuck. Poke a fucking hole in his neck. No dice. Bag must have broke because he got all foamy at the mouth. Started spazzing out and then just croaked. That's when we started to panic. This fool gulped tens of thousands worth of eddies. What the fuck else are we supposed to do? So I looked this up, which has probably put me on a list somewhere now, but the average drug user apparently can consume 0.5 to 1.5 grams of that stuff per day. 7 ounces then is about 200 grams, i.e. between half a year to over a year's worth of products. And the fact that these guys punched a hole in his neck and then the bag broke, well odds are they probably caused that to happen. And as if things couldn't get any worse, they left their own guns out in the car. And getting back there involves going through a door which which they can barely even remember the code to. Now on your way through to the garage, make sure not to miss this confiscated airdrop containing the flame imbuing Volkadav razor machete. But of course reaching the garage, seconds before these two gonk brained cops drive away, Dodger of course arrives. And whilst this is the only time we meet him in the game, much like Jotaro Shobo and Joanne Coke, Dodger is very much a looming presence mentioned on shards back in Dogtown. And a large role he appears to have is to serve as a go-between for Bar guest and the voodoos. Defeating Io Zarin up here in this Luxor Heights criminal activity, we can learn that Dodger has hired 12 netrunners from her before, to act as net security for the party we go to during You Know My Name, repaying her in turn with the location of airdrops, which again can explain the voodoo presence at some of them. And in fact, in one of the airdrop shards, we can find Dodger's orders for a full suite of netrunning gear for these guys. Also, at another drop is one suggesting that Dodger has worked directly with the Cassell twins, though he just refers to them as him and her here, seeking their help to smuggle someone named Theodore across the border with humanitarian aid, which I'm gonna take to mean drugs for getting rich. According to Dodge's database entry C, drugs has always been his business, eventually forcing him into Dogtown after being on the run not just from the NCPD, but also the Tiger Claws whom he insulted, and also some nomads that he robbed of several million eddies. Luckily for him, he's found a final home with Hansen. Anyway, with some context on Dodger back to this scene, which plays out more like a movie than a game, with Dodger himself giving off some big Negan vibes, quizzing Bill and Charlie as to what exactly happened to his products, whilst they grovelingly try and lie their way out of this poorly. See, I really don't like being made a fool of. Boys. Yes, if we too try to lie or just draw our weapon, Dodger will need taking down and that'll be that. But if we come clean and just say they're lying, Dodger will be able to extract a confession. That they lost the product, tried to retrieve it, and when that failed, hired us for fear of death. Fortunately, Dodger finds the whole story hilarious and tells Bill and Charlie they're free to go. So long as the bar guest upstairs are all alive, that is. Sigs are all flat, boss. Scratch what I say. Afraid I can't let you go. If you did manage upstairs non-lethally though, Dodger will let them go with the assurance they haven't seen the last of him, essentially leaving them to be tormented by Dodger in the future. In fact, doing it this way, it's later possible to come across Bill by the City Hall, who, while still on the force, laments the fact that we didn't kill Dodger, saying he's nothing but his rat now, and Dodger keeps threatening everyone he loves. Honestly, much as this gig kind of gears you towards this resolution, merely forcing you to kill Dodger as a result of laziness, that in my opinion is easily the best outcome here. Not only are Charlie and Bill free from Dodger's influence, but we'll also loot Dodger's iconic pistol Roscoe, which in 2.1 had its description amended to say that leg shots are just very good at knocking down enemies. It's got some awesome punch and is definitely worth getting. Also doing it this way and running into Bill later, he'll instead be running a hot dog stand in the Glen, having left the force and being much happier for it. Now with eventual plans to instead open up his own restaurant. The dude seems to have genuinely found his calling in life, and I guess it's all thanks to us. As for Charlie, he stayed on the force and no doubt wound up right back in shit. But nice to see one of them at least gets a happy ending. Plus, if we accept, we can get an extra 2k. So overall, I'd say the comedic writing of this one especially lands it as another S-tier gig. 
The Man Who Killed Jason Foreman is a revenge gig to locate and take out, well, the man who killed Jason Foreman, a citizen of Longshore Stacks who is shaping up to be quite the renowned fixer around Dogtown. And it's actually quite sad to get to know him by reading all the various shards, realising the entire time he's no longer around. Though we can see what he looks like by heading to his home before unlocking the gig, we just can't talk to him. Starting the gig though, we'll touch base with Brianna Dolson, who'll explain that Jason and seven others from the Stacks were killed by a Barghest soldier named Leon Rinder, though his motives for doing so, as of yet, are unclear. We just know that Jason was supposed to put Rinder in contact with the scabs, but during their meet, Rinder obliterated everyone in the vicinity. Scanning the crime scene, we can learn more, and Johnny will also chime in, which is great for these investigative moments. In fact, not only did Rinder blast the place with an HMG, but he also violently smashed Jason's head into the ground. Yeah, this was more than a businessy systematic hit. It seems you're looking for a bored out killing machine that's lost all self control. And to find said killing machine, we'll need to crack the shard that Brianna gave us. This is Foreman's message to the scavs, since for some reason Rinder needs to shed some chrome and is offering it up to them of all people, over in the Los Osos Motel. We'll be heading there in a minute, but first, let's see what else we can find out about Jason and the crime scene. The memorial, of course, is a tragic thing to behold. We have Jason's mourning mother, Martha, as well as obituaries to multiple other victims, hear from their parents, their children, and their siblings. It's clear this Rinder guy, through this one singular rampage, has destroyed a ton of people's lives. And it's no wonder 17 of the survivors then pulled together to hire us for revenge. If we come behind the main area then, we can find Jason's secret little hideouts, where we can learn about a previous op involving a Barghest airdrop that went terribly wrong. After Jason was able to acquire coordinates for these drops, he hired a woman named Ellie Scott to hit them before Barghest could, stashing whatever she loots in his garage. A place we can also go to, up by the stadium, the code for which is 3709. Sadly, there's nothing of value here, just an archer quartz we can't interact with, and a communication between Jason and Ellie. Ellie's instructions for how to get the cargo and what to do with the money, that being to give it to Brianna. Unfortunately, Barghest of course come looking for their missing cargo, rolling into Longshore Stacks as reported by Dorothy Allred, one of Jason's lookouts, and in the middle of the night, one of these patrols bust into a resident's house, shoots his son, and carries the guy away. So inadvertently, Jason's attempt to raise scratch for the stacks possibly wound up causing more devastation than good. A retrospective foreshadowing, I suppose, to his eventual fate. But the Jason Foreman references don't stop there. When fighting the cyber junkie Sean McMillan up here, there's another shard indicating that Jason has ties with Wakako and transfers her large sums of data about Dogtown. So the guy was fairly well connected. And also, Julia Foreman is a fixer name that comes up on Dave Dover's shards, another cyber junkie, and my guess is that this is a relative of Jason's that he may liaise with operating in Night City. Finally, Jason also was contacted by Katia Carolina, but we'll come back to that in a bit for the Spy in the Jungle gig. Now, finally heading to the Scav Hotel, Brianna reminds us to bring back Grinder's dog tag as proof of his death. And after seeing the suffering he's wrought, that shouldn't be a problem. This place is described as having better food than Kabuki, more peaceful sleep than North Oak, and more fun than Cloud. Quite possibly the biggest lie ever, as we can see the second we step through the door. This appears to be a scav trap, where the actual food they do is, well I don't even know what this is, but it sounds gross. This place though is pretty connected with the Terra Cognita scavs, just like Longshore Stacks was. And specifically, these guys are heavily in contact with Demir, a scav ripper based out of one of the museum buildings, whom we meet during No Easy Way Out. Looks like after Rinder came to from his catastrophic outburst, he was still looking for Demir to remove his implants. And escaping Dogtown via the secret exit of Ross Alma's base, one of the bosses we fight during a criminal activity, Rinder escaped Dogtown and wound up here. And it also sounds as though some of Hassan's Zeta Tech stuff was transferred to this place as well. On her downstairs scab laptop is an interesting bit of lore that the scabs have an agreement not to kidnap and harvest any VDBs, in order to avoid devastating gang turf wars and the like. Additionally is a contact that connects to the next gig, Talent Academy, a screwed up place 
device that implants kids way too young for chrome in order to enhance their sporting ability. And this guy, who has a contact there, is attempting to sell off cybernetic implants that were made for children. This gear, however, is turned down, and we'll touch on maybe why later. Through the kitchens is a side room locked behind 15 tech, though you can also access it via a bathroom vents. And it has a couple emails. The first explains how the scavs kidnap many chromed up people without alerting trauma team, basically by slotting a signal jamming chip into them within 15 seconds before trauma gets alerted. We've also here got a callback all the way to Sandra Dorset. And if you ever wondered how the scavs managed to kidnap such an elite netrunner, though probably with the help of Night Corp 2, turns out they used some brute force software to completely crash Sandra's chrome. A key contact they have for all this stuff it seems is the kid netrunner Sammy Taylor, who we can buy from at the stadium. And whilst helping them out for eddies, Sammy is clearly wise enough to refuse an offer to straight up join with the scavs properly. From another scav, we can indeed learn that Rinder, aka the Barges guy, is being kept upstairs, with the HMG he used in the massacre sat on the table down here, and his biomonitor is back in that tech room. Due to the nature of how valuable Rinder's implants are, the scavs insisted Demir himself be brought in to extract the chrome, since they really didn't trust anyone else to do a good enough job. The implants then go up for sale, but we still don't know why Rinder wanted it removed, though he is one of the few to still be alive after a scav operation, and is being kept down the hall, paying the scavs for their quote unquote hospitality. Not that it isn't business as usual for the scavs, and indeed they've still got lists of names for people they want to kidnap and extract the implants from. In fact, reading these dossiers of sorts, it's actually incredibly creepy how much forward planning goes into each mark that they hit. Like I just assumed the scavs waited down dark alleys to hit on unsuspecting victims, but this is far worse. There's genuine strategy here, and if you're unlucky enough to fall on the scavs radar, a 15 second quick and coordinated attack is all it'll take to never be seen again. I mean, they've even got a whole operations board here, as well as an entire refrigeration section for storing internal cyberware. Though the fact that many of their ranks are incapable of remembering how to do that does at least suggest many of their coordinated attacks are just a little too clever for most of the lackeys to carry out. After all, being a scav is probably the least aspirational role ever, and the reason this terminal reads mannequins in their plans is because they even have literal mannequins set up for each victim, with price estimates written on various body parts. This is what Demir is actually using as reference for which parts of Rinder to take, which can now be seen hanging above his mannequin. But honestly, this has to be the most detailed and referential of all of Dogtown's gigs, and there's also a mention of Fant here, a drug which, as we know, is causing an epidemic in Dogtown, and now the scavs are planning to export it into Night City, starting from here, after sampling it for themselves, obviously, and winding up totally incoherent. Yeah, they will not be missed. Alongside Rinder, though, there are other patients being kept here, Misha Sorokin, a member of their own ranks by the looks, as well as Fyodor Dmitriev. But as far as non-scav patients go, Rinder is the only one. Though according to an email from Demir, his Kuroshi implant has a virus, rendering it useless, apparently caused by the beginnings of Hepatitis B. I actually didn't realise that real diseases could infect cybernetics like that, so that's kind of interesting. Now, when we open the door to Rinder himself, we have to first deal with Yasha Ivanov, who, to be fair, is a pretty tough boss that as of patch 2.1 got even tougher, uploading reboot optics, having powerful guns, and turning invisible. Taking him down though, we can learn that he was assigned to be Rinder's personal bodyguard, after seeing an apparently insane amount of eddies that Rinder was paying him. So, time to take down this slaughtering lunatic once and for all. Yet, upon seeing the guy and reading his file, it becomes clear that his actions, back at the stacks, weren't entirely his own, suffering, firstly, from PTSD, and when quizzed about the stacks, claiming he doesn't remember killing anybody, simply wanting to sell off his chrome and get treated for his illness, after Bargast rewarded his eight years of service by leaving him out to dry. Apparently, his last memory of Jason was the start of their meeting, where Jason was waving around a gun. Of course, what Rinder did afterwards was utterly savage, and whilst confessing to regret his actions, he'll still express genuine anger at Jason and the Stax Dweller's way of life, cooped up in shipping containers as a community, and never expecting anyone to leave. So, as usual, we have a choice to make. Several choices, actually. We can finish the job we were sent for, shoot Rinder, retrieve his dog tag, and give it to Brianna, completing the mission as set out. They'll take care of Jason's mother, and life at the stacks will continue on. This memorial will go up to never be forgotten, though Johnny suspects that will eventually fade away. Problem is, doing it this way, we miss out on one of the game's best 
shotguns, as well as more general info on Ryder. And when Ryder begs for his life, it also comes with a little bribe. Spare him, and he'll give you the location and code to his garage, where we can grab Deserter, learn that Ryder was somewhat aware of his blackouts trying to get them sorted, and that he was terrified Hansen would let him go for being a defective soldier, which of course was exactly what happened. I think overall, a better, more productive way to pursuing the let Rinder live path though, is to choose the let me enlighten you option, which allows V to come to the realisation that Rinder is suffering from cyberpsychosis, which let's be honest was pretty obvious the whole time. In this instance, we can make him call Regina and actually get the help that he needs. We'll still get the location and code to his garage a little bit later, as well as his dog tag there and then. Problem with letting him go free though, is he'll eventually reflect, realising he probably didn't deserve to be spared and out of guilt, sending a donation to the citizens of Longshore. Obviously, this tips off Brianna to the fact that he's alive, and if we see her again, she's none too happy, but keeps up the pretense that Rinder is dead for the sake of the other's morale. Which is a shame, because in the end, Rinder wasn't completely responsible for his actions, though at the same time, does he deserve to go free? Still highly debatable, really. Which is why instead, we can agree to spare him, get the code to his garage, take his tag, and then shoot him in the face. The citizens of Longshore get what they want, and we can get fancy gear. Definitely a dishonourable way to play it, but at the same time, it's a dishonour to the people who hired us to not complete the job, so tough one. Personally, I chose to call Regina. But overall, for such a brilliantly nuanced and detailed gig, building up the whole character of Jason only to have him die, I do of course name it an S tier gig. Oh, this next one is good. A screwed up sports academy for young athletes, a little undercover work, and at the heart of it all, collecting taxes. See, Fiona Vargas, head of the Talent Academy in Dogtown, one of hundreds around the globe, is using this place's lawlessness to get away with all sorts of shady shit. Things far worse than tax evasion, like performing ops on kids who are legally way too young to have work done. But as always, taxes is the thing people, in this case the European economic community, actually care about. I'm a drug dealer. Eh, wrong, million times worse, you're a tax cheat. So heading in as Victoria Wilson, a buyer, our job is to find Fiona's office and steal her data on everyone who's ever signed a contract with her. Now, who would have thunk that under what is essentially ruins would be this incredibly flashy place? Officially named the Center for Neuromotor Development, Site 341, specializing in training and ultimately signing off young athletes to sports clubs around the world, boasting plenty of famous names already and seeming from the outset like an institution helping young kids to achieve their dreams. Of course, for most of them, this is a terrible, terrible lie. The place comes complete with controllable robot avatars, allowing individuals to be there without being there, via an interface which we'll learn is really unsafe, though no doubt safer than the operations being performed on these kids. And coming into the main room, it's kind of shocking to see how young they actually are, some literally no older than seven, having already been installed with an insane amount of cyberware, and now being sold off in a a glorified auction house. One surefire way to blow our cover immediately though is to sit and have a drink, then allow ourselves to be grilled on the team we're supposedly with. We'll be escorted out for re-verification, and once that fails, the place turns into a combat zone. Best thing to do here instead then is shut down any questions, after which we'll get this distraction, which allows us to sneak away. But before we can descend into Fiona's office, let's first learn a bit more up here. Through this 15 tech door, out behind the reception, is a terminal saying a few new employees were taken on from within Dogtown. Probably how Hans got our man at the outside, inside. And another cool thing back here can be found up in this little tunnel shaft thing through some piping. Seems an employee named Lucas Clark is stealing one of these bots, selling it on to his contact, Oscar Garcia. The same Oscar Garcia that was trying to sell implants from this place to the scavs in the previous gig. Now, coming across to the security room of sorts, also upstairs, we can learn that, yeah, these robots can impart some really bad side effects onto their users, with a complaint on here about how one of them got severe headaches, as well as a previous operator's memories tangled up with theirs when the cache didn't properly clear. Familiar scenario much, V? Though unlike this user, V didn't get offered a 5% discount next time they want to sign a player, something that I'm sure makes the identity crisis absolutely worth it. Also in this room though is a ventilation shaft, shortcutting us downstairs through where the robots are kept, a place where we can learn that this memory overload problem 
problem is far more common than it first appeared. And yet, yeah, these guys are still incorporating the robots into their business, because, you know, profit. Now, this is a great shortcut to get downstairs, but let's take a look at the back office up there as well, in which we can learn that armed guards aren't permitted around the kids because it disturbs their training, which to be fair is not an unnice policy to have. And reading the shard on one of the guards, it turns out his wife was begging him to leverage his role as staff in order to get their son admitted and become a basketball player. Clearly, to the outside world, this is a prestigious place that parents want to send their children to. It's when descending downstairs though, with the code behind reception, which is 3479 by the way, and down here, the evil of this place becomes clear, but at the same time, a little bit grey. In one instance, an employee attempted to stall chipping an injured kid with a muscle implant, claiming that nerve connections should first be regrown naturally, but only concerned with efficiency and sporting performance rather than the long-term health of the subject, this op is rushed forward anyway, potentially causing problems for this 11-year-old kid further down the line. Reading on about the various kids they're training here, and it's a very mixed bag. Some, like Emma Lee, are getting signed onto teams, whilst others, like Tommy Walker, are being branded with zero developmental prospects and told to let go. The list goes on, but the long and short is that not everyone gets signed. In fact, very few get signed. And yes, of course, that's the game. They want the best of the best. Except, in this instance, it gets so much worse. See, also down here are a couple dossiers which go into more detail on kids who were dismissed. Sadly, this is all too common an occurrence, due largely to the body's failure to fully take on certain implants. This not only makes the kids unable to compete in sports, but can cause major long-term health defects. Severe migraines, leg immobility, chronic depression, and more. But having then been kicked from the academy, there's no longer financial support to deal with any of these issues. Most kids essentially come here, rack up major health maintenance bills, and then get left out to dry. Does Dr. Fiona care? Nope, because at the end of the day, the ruined lives of most is utterly eclipsed by the few who go on to have successful careers, ending up on her wall of fame. Though this here is where things get grey, and if you've made your way downstairs stealthily, you'll get to have a chat with Emma Lee, recently signed on to a baseball team. She's clearly excited and happy to make her parents proud, enthusiastic, and will hopefully be one of the few who are actually lifted up by this practice. Though there have been other champions before like her, and we'll go find them in Dogtown after. But the long and short is that even getting signed here does not guarantee a long and prosperous life. In Fiona's office, we then meet Tommy, a kid who's been branded poorly performing with low self-esteem and not fit for further training. Currently, he's rooting around in the hopes of finding he's been signed to a team. His family are Dogtown based, and him hitting the big leagues is their last hope. That's not necessarily what he wants, though his parents are just trying to gear him towards a better life. In a moment, we'll be able to choose whether he gets one. See, when stealing Fiona's files, she'll confront us, and wanting to protect her business, of course, offers a deal. Only leaking the tax evasion data of her less important clients, and also promising that Tommy will now get signed. This will turn the life around of that one kid, and he'll wind up on some European team. What's more, Hans will still consider the job complete, and pay us accordingly. The same goes for if we take the deal but leave Tommy out of it. Though in this case, his life will of course play out as it would have done. And sadly, he'll probably run out of prospects. I don't really know why you wouldn't sign the poor kids, but at the same time, it might just mean we're trading some other kid's life for his. As Fiona says, only 20% of those who come here actually end up anywhere, and I'd wager a very large chunk of the remaining 80 come out with worse prospects than they went in with. I mean, purely by maths alone, is it worth all those destroyed lives for the few that go on to be extraordinary? On Fiona's own laptop, in fact, we can read even more examples of this. While she is flying around giving talks on bioengineering and sports, we've got some parents mailing words of thanks for turning their kid into a superstar, whilst others are begging for financial aid. Their rejected child no longer able to afford the medication they need from modifications sustained in this place. In a response to this message from Fiona's assistant, the parents are told they knew the risks when they signed up, and will now simply have to deal with the consequences. And I mean, yeah, parents who sign their kids away to dangerous programs like this should have probably known better. But of course, the ones really suffering are the ones who probably never got a choice in the first place. The children who were volunteered up from as early as the age of seven, or possibly younger. And all the suffering wrought by this program, it does make it tempting to destroy Fiona and burn this place to the ground. Though doing so, we will find Tommy later at the stadium with his dad, who explains that that place 
place was Tommy's final hope of a better life, as opposed to when we get him signed and he's absolutely buzzing to go and play in Europe. So overall, it's really tough to decide how to resolve this one. And worse still, you actually feel pretty powerless to make any kind of dent in the overall practice. This is Site 341. It's happening all over the world. Getting this one shut down, it'll probably just reopen soon enough. Whatever we do, we'll be saving some kids from long-term issues whilst robbing others of a life of stardom. Of course, we want to help Tommy, yes, but I think finding some more ex-attendees down in Longshore Stacks cements the notion that kids getting signed isn't necessarily helping. Jacob Bernard, of course, is one of the cyber junkies we can find, a world-class basketball player who then descended into madness and lost contact with everyone in his life, and who I explored in more detail in the Cyber Junkies video. But also, we have the sad case of Julia Young, bound back here in a tipped over dumpster, scared out of her mind, with a second place boxing trophy, and a diary of her time at the academy. Signed on at 11, Fiona quickly became the best, addicted to the training regime, becoming superhuman and feeling like a god. And she was utterly unbeatable at just 14. But when turning 16, her cyberware began to malfunction, and Julia learned she had cyberware induced neuropathy. Without hesitation, Fiona kicked her out, no longer profitable to the regime. And now, if it weren't for this shard, we'd think Julia just another nobody, sitting in a corner having fant induced hallucinations, which from the outset do not appear pleasant. I don't know what will ultimately happen to Tommy, and I don't know what the best solution here is. I think maybe, on balance, Fiona can't keep getting away with it, but then stopping her doesn't stop the regime. Do we pursue a small act of anger, or a small act of potential kindness for Tommy, which may still backfire. This one has genuinely stumped me, morally, and there's no way of knowing the longer term implications either way, so I'd recommend tossing a coin to your Witcher. I hate the fact that it's not clearer than that, but it is still an absolute S tier gig. This next one feels a little bit like the plot of a Mission Impossible movie, in the sense that two intelligence agents are forced to go rogue in order to save their friends, after not receiving commission from high command. Steven Santos and Anna Friedman work for Brazilian intelligence and need our help to rescue their fellow agent Mark Banner, whose biomonitor is still active up at the Organotopia Museum of Terra Cognita. Problem is, as mere analysts with no combat training, the two can't get near it, due to the hefty number of scavs in the vicinity as well as ex spetnaz agent Boris Ribakov. Now, Banner's final transmission to them did seem fairly conclusive that the guy was totally screwed, though fair play to these two, not potentially leaving their colleague out to dry. Before we leave the brief though, check out this shard at the back, as it details the discovery of recent oil deposits in Brazil, whose government is currently in talks with Sovoil, a huge Russian megacorp and rival to Petrochem, about having access to the deposits. Now, whilst in 2077 fossil fuels have all but been replaced with the synthetically grown Chu 2, oil is still a working and profitable resource. Therefore, a partnership between Brazil and the USSR is of major interest to both parties. Keep this in mind, as it'll be important later. Coming to Organotopia then, and the scavs are serious about getting in here, having blasted open one of the shutter doors, which is pretty convenient for us. And according to this guy, many of the scavs have been summoned from all around for some reason, all up into this place. Intriguing. Jacking into this link to get inside, we'll see seemingly confirm that Banner is indeed alive. He establishes contact with us, saying he's hurt and that we need to get to him. This of course means fighting our way through what feels like Jurassic Park, though just fighting regular humans still, not dinosaurs. And if you want, you can learn all about the various exhibits here across this huge museum complex. Organotopia is just one big wing, and there's also the Digimortal section on Cyberware, where the Scav Ripadoc Damir is based and we go to for no easy way out, the ESC Explorer Space Area, where most of the scavs are, and the Anatomicon building, where we find Wesley Hunt, a cyber junkie but also a huge blade reference. The first room in Organotopia that we come through though, the one with all the trees, actually has a secret side room, and to get to it, it involves diving down into the river in the middle and swimming up through some pipes. In here, we can learn that this place was originally set to open on the 10th of April 2069, nice, though a mere 10 days short of the best day of the century. Of course, funding got pulled and now the entire region is a massive 
of Scavden. But at least the trees are still here, indeed making it feel like a jungle, and there's also a list of what exactly all of them are. As well as a quick way to disable the cameras to sneak through to the gift shop more easily. Where the scav trail stops for now, as Banner appears to have the door ahead locked tight, but of course opens it for us. Leading into the dinosaur section, though with a warning to keep an eye out for special agent Ribikov. In here, we've got holographic skeletons of both the Mosasaurus and a couple T-Rexes. Not life-size, but maybe babies. But what this room mostly is, is our arena for fighting Ribikov, who'll drop in from above as we're opening this door. Part 1 of the fight is fairly easy, just don't get sniped. For part 2, weapon glitch was my saving grace, surviving his deadly SMG. And finally, for the end of the fight, you'll have to find the real Ribikov amidst an army of decoys before he's able to cast System Collapse. Doing this, make sure not to miss his fantastic Warden SMG, Pizdets, which is apparently a very rude Russian word, though possibly the only smart weapon in the game to come silenced. But also, this guy has a contract on him to terminate Katya Karolina, a Sovoil interrogator who accidentally killed somebody she definitely shouldn't have. And desperately wanting to cover the whole thing up, the Soviets sent the hit not just to Ribikov, but to the predominantly Soviet gang of the Scabs. Seems they're not here for Banner then, but rather for this Katya. Indeed, Banner truly has been dead this entire time, and the person we were speaking to was Katya using a voice changer. Basically, she captured Banner in Dogtown and, not knowing who he was, tortured the guy for information. He explained to her that he's a Brazilian agent, yet orders came through from up top to kill him anyway. She claims she tried to keep him alive, though that's of little consequence. Through her actions and Sovoil's orders, Banner eventually died of his injuries, or perhaps she did even deliver the killing blow. We can even see, when getting up from her chair, that that's possibly where Banner was tortured. Or maybe Katya just got injured on the way here. Of course, she and Sovoil realise what a total screw-up this was after the fact, but by then the corp are already desperate to hush the whole thing up by purging everyone involved. Due, of course, to the ongoing negotiations regarding Brazil's oil deposits. If it's learned that Sovoil had one of Brazil's agents killed, those negotiations would utterly break down. Good for neither them nor Brazil. And indeed, this is no doubt why Brazil didn't want the matter looked into either, not wanting to confirm the inconvenient truth. We can decide what happens with that in a moment, but first, what's to do with Katya? She was, after all, just doing her job and is an unfortunate scapegoat in this. And to grease our palms a little more is the promise of a reward. See, Katya had ordered some eddies from a guy called Jerry, but after getting holed up here, asked him to hide it in the stacks. Hours if we let her go. And killing her affords nothing extra, really, save for immediately a shard outlining exactly how the scabs found her. See, she placed her trust in a colleague, Olya, sending coordinates for her location to be rescued, and Olya just coldly forwards it to Sovoil. That's some classic corpo cutthroating right there. Now, if you are gonna kill her, you might as well at least just get the location of her stash first. It won't spawn if you don't, and there's like 16,000 eddies there. Personally, I'd say just let her go, but actually, a quick death is something of a mercy compared to the alternative. Thing is, Katya had a whole escape route planned out along Luxor Heights. She was in contact with a brilliant fixer, Jason Foreman, and he'd set up a little safe house for her to run to. We can access it after the mission, in fact. It's just over here by the statue, and it's where we find the Xmod 2 Kappa. Before Jason could finalise everything, though, he went off to meet a Barghest soldier, and, well, I explained that about 20 minutes ago. But cool to see how the misfortunes of one gig can also cause the misfortunes of another. Making her way down here, Katya is instead carted into a scav van, gets her implants harvested, and slowly and painfully dies. We can follow this trail of blood and find her body down here if we let her go. In this case, Sovoil again got the data and ordered the scavs to finish her off. There's also potentially an airdrop we can find referencing this event, where the scavs had ordered in a ton of gear purely to deal with Katya. But if the gig is complete, they'll say it's like sending snacks after the vodka's already drunk. So sadly, whatever we do, Katya is just one of those that we simply can't save. Though the same doesn't go for Anna and Steven, and when heading back to them, Steven will text begging for us to leave the Biomon at a drop point, knowing that Anna will leak info on Banner's death and hurt everyone involved, including the two of them. We can do it this way, or we can return it to the two and hear them out before making our final decision, to destroy it or hand it to Anna. By destroying it, the Sovoil deal will go ahead as planned, and we'll later unlock a little meeting to check in with Steven. He's doing well here, looking to get promoted in the life he chose, and will give us 3k to say thank you. Brazil too, is about to become very very rich thanks to the Sovoil contract, though for Anna, she continued to question the 
agency's choices and eventually got fired. Not sure where she ends up in this timeline, but no doubt it's better than the alternative. See, by handing the biomonitor to her, she'll cause everything to go to shit. In this scenario, we'll instead see Steven again at the stadium, working as a bar guest analyst, having gone into hiding after really screwing over the Brazilian intelligence agency. Anna, on the other hand, left Dogtown, got picked up by the agency, and wound up in prison. A hefty price for doing the right thing. The Sov Oil deal falls through, some director gets fired for covering up Banner's death, and the only person who seems to profit from this is Banner's widow, receiving a posthumous medal on his behalf and alleviating the financial burden of having him gone. Which, I mean, that's nice, but in my opinion, a small comfort compared to the many, many lives that will now be worse off in Brazil, without the billions that would have been pumped into that economy. Not to mention Anna and Steven. Johnny, of course, would approve of this choice, it's very anti-corp, stick it to the man kind of play, but truly, can we really argue that this is the best outcome here? I don't know, what do you think? I think it's a proper spy side quest in a spy-themed expansion, and on the whole, another S-tier gig. These final two only unlock after completing both Firestarter and the Run This Town side quest, serving as gigs for the third act of Phantom Liberty. Heaviest of Hearts is a gig that finally allows us to explore more of the Heavy Hearts pyramid slash club, but first we need to meet with Michael Maldonado, who explains that his son Eric has been arrested and sentenced by DA Georgina Zembinski, who also forced Michael to testify against his own son. Allegedly, Eric has connections to a Valentino kingpin, and only by arresting him can Georgina get closer to taking them down. Immediately, a big question is why Michael testified against his son in the first place, to which he gives the cagey answer that he was beaten and they threatened to hurt his son worse, then sticking a camera in his face and forcing him to say whatever they wanted. Now of course, Michael wants us to convince Georgina to reverse her decision, claiming that Eric is nothing but an innocent guy who runs a bike repair shop in Haywood. So heading to the Heavy Hearts Club to find Georgina, and Hans politely asks, that we do this discreetly, given, you know, he's only just upstairs. Of course, you can go guns blazing in through the front door, and the only real difference it's gonna make is a two grand bonus from Mr. Hands. Though the place is clearly designed to be navigated stealthily, with multiple ways to reach the upper floor where Zimbinski can be found. For instance, this dressing room, locked behind some tech skill, has a laptop suggesting Georgina is up in room four, with this guy having just been kicked out of there. The same is confirmed by Toilet Jack, a guide doing business out of the club bathroom, which is also a bizarrely common practice in real life, and we can speak to him after being directed there by the bartender. For 550 eddies, he'll call upstairs just to confirm the same thing that she's in room 4, but if you're a street kid, you can instead offer contacts to expand his little business into the clubs of Night City. Funny thing is, doing this, he'll actually text you a while later following up on this opportunity, though sadly all we can do is blow him off. Of course, knowing where she is and getting there are two totally different things. And at first, the VIP door isn't gonna budge. To get it open, you'll either have to sneak past this guard by the elevator, which to be fair isn't very hard, or if you're very very stealthy, past the side entrance to the bar. Each of these will bring you to a terminal with general info on the running of Heavy Hearts, a bar guest run organisation of course, but one that also hires in the Voodoo Boys for net running security. This is arranged once again by Io Zarin, the boss up in Luxor Heights, who if you remember has also also directly dealt with Dodger before. Also, the club often has to deal with high-class snobbish guests on the regular, and order in airdrops especially containing very specific booze. There's also a warning that guards in the VIP lounge will be on high alert for anyone not supposed to be up there. And yeah, stealth is a must once we get upstairs. We can, from this terminal, open the VIP door and proceed up that way, but since you're already by the kitchen, it's just as easy to take this central stairwell, dropping the guards as we do. Atop these stairs is quite a funny shot between a guy and the woman who kicked him out of the club a few days ago. And fair play to him, dude straight up got the confidence to then ask her out on a date. Which remarkably, she says yes to. Guess there's hope for some even in Dogtown. Now into the main upstairs lounge, and there's several booths we can explore with various interesting bits of world building, including an explanation as to how the moon's mass drivers can double as nuclear level weapons, levelling entire cities if they want it. That's in booth 1. In booth 
with two is an article about Pacifica development resuming with a budget of 6 billion euro dollars. Perhaps we'll see the district more incorporated with the rest of NC in Orion. Booth 3 is advertising a brain dance showing the lived experience, or died experience I suppose, of a skydiver whose parachute failed to open. Because of course death is a source of cheap thrills in 2077. But finally, coming to Booth 4, it turns out Georgina isn't here. And questioning her stuck up law friends, it turns out she's rather now in Booth 6, the one involving passing the absolute most guards we could possibly have to, but fairly straightforward with optical camo and the vanishing act perk. First though, this booth also has an article chronicling how Georgina was able to sentence a high profile leader of the scavs named Ivan Sobol to a life imprisonment. Impressive considering how atrociously dire NC law enforcement generally seems and how scavs are free to roam every dark alley, even with those masks that clearly identified them. In fact, before Georgina got involved, the case seemed thin, and everyone assumed that the guy would walk free. It was only her closing speech that actually turned the tables. Immediate points to Georgina, because any enemy of the scavs is, well, not a worst of the worst despicable human being. Booth 5 does also contain something of interest, a settlement where a low-ranking Militech employee ran over a high-ranking one from Arasaka, causing him spinal damage and the loss of both legs. Normally, corpos have immunity to mistakes like this, as seen in the eye for an eye gig from the base game, but in this instance, due to the difference in rank, the Militech employee is liable for prosecution. Utterly crazy how law is done in this world, but scarily close to reality. Anyway, finally getting where we're supposed to be, booth 6, either sneakily through the front door or by unlocking the hidden entrance from this back area, in the suitcase here, do not miss Crime Stopper, an iconic capper with the fantastic ability to cast cripple movement on enemies extremely often. Also here is a convo between Georgina and a judge named Nathaniel Edwards, about how they're going to secure a warrant to arrest Hector Sacristan, the aforementioned Valentino Kingpin whom they're really after. Nathaniel claims that it can no longer be done because the Valentinos have now gotten to his boss, whom I presume is Mayor Weldon Holt? I don't know, who's above a judge? Maybe a higher judge? Anyway, Georgina gets what she wants by threatening to tell Nathaniel's wife that he's cheating with a juror. And that about settles things. Thus far, actually, mad respect for how she's actually prosecuting gang leaders. Something we haven't seen from anyone else before, aside from fixers. And heading into Georgina's actual booth, it quickly becomes clear that the story of Eric's arrest isn't exactly how Michael said it was either. Indeed, his son Eric clearly was working for Hector. This is why the DA needs him behind bars in order to get to the kingpin. And if Michael's own Valentino tattoos are anything to go by, there's definitely a family history with the gang. Also, according to Georgina, Michael wasn't forced into testifying at all, but rather took a bribe of Eddie's, which wound up with his son behind bars, to the aid of the DA's investigation. She even shows us the actual tape confirming this, and afterwards when we confront him about taking a bribe, the guy doesn't deny it, though clearly Hank pacing behind with a gun here probably nudged him along too. The issue with all of this really is we never get to meet Eric, never get a feel for his character and to decide if he deserves bars or not. But what I will say is Zembinski has a good history of prosecuting dangerous criminals, and if we stand in the way of that, forcing the testimony to be deleted, we also keep a mass murdering Valentino boss out of prison. Now in Georgina's view, Michael doesn't actually care if his son is in prison or not, he just doesn't want the guilt of Eric knowing that his own dad helped put him there. So she offers us a deal, to wipe Michael's name from the case. We can of course refuse, to which her guard Hank will pipe up, and those strong enough can play the very justified I'm V and I've killed Legion stronger than you cards. Otherwise, we we will have to take him out, and doing so we'll learn that he's not a clean but is an effective cop, taking money on the side to compensate for his rejected raise requests, but as he's one of the few officers to actually close cases, it's really not in their interests to fire him. Sounds standard, albeit on the more effective side of police work in Night City. Deleting the tapes then, Michael will feel a weight off his conscience, no longer burdened with their heaviest of hearts, and continuing to run his little arcade store. Weird way of doing it, taking a bribe then using that bribe bribe money to undo the effects of taking said bribe, but hey, I guess in the end we're the ones to profit from that. Is it the right thing to do? Well, let's see. Because if we agree to Zembinski's deal, Michael will be furious, but when we call him out, is left with little to say. Hans pays us all the same. Returning to Michael's place later though, it's clear his name wasn't wiped from the case entirely. Eric still found out what his dad did, and so his Valentino buddies came
came all the way to Dogtown to trash this store. Michael says it's all our fault and we should have done what he asked, but again falls silence when we call out the mistakes that he made. Not a great day for him, but is it harsh to say he had it coming? Sure, Guy made an effort to rectify his mistake, but it was a pretty shitty mistake to make in the first place. What's more, in this instance we can read a shard detailing Hector's arrest. Georgina's plan was a success, and Night City has become a fraction safer. Will another Valentino rise up and take his place? Probably, and if not, a different gang entirely will just fill the power vacuum. But hey, maybe it will just make things a smidgen better. So that's what it comes down to, sentencing a dangerous criminal or saving a bad father's arcade store. I think the fact that Michael blames us when it's destroyed though, rather than acknowledging his own mistake here, even when directly called out, that kind of makes me want to pick this option. And from that to the fantastic Egyptian setting, another S tier gig. Our final gig in Dogtown then involves aiding a terrorist to thwart a terrorist attack. Yep, another example of someone having a change of heart. Though it's quite a bit more serious this time. Nell Springer is our contact and she is a member of Crimson Harvest, an anti-biotechnica group rebelling against the fact that the corporation keep kicking farmers off their land in order to grow more Chew 2, the synthetic biofuel that's mostly taken over from oil. In fact, it may even be the case that Biotechnica previously released pathogens which prevented any non-biotechnica crops from growing. Though this is unconfirmed and I'll have to dive into it more some other time. Of course, like most of the more radical protesters, Crimson Harvest's methods are far from innocent, and they're not afraid to cause collateral damage that also affects innocents, so long as biotechnica take a hit. Their next attack is a net nuke in Berlin designed not to blow up buildings, but rather upload a net virus to simply kill the people. Nell doesn't want that on her conscience, clearly some past guilt that she won't elaborate on just yet, so tasks us with breaking into the stadium's armory and uploading a shard to neutralize the virus. This is the one time we get access to this wing of the stadium, and if you haven't done the hidden quest to repair the robot ironclad yet, you might want to get that done before embarking on this gig, since a reward obtained from one of that quest's endings is hidden through here, along with, as usual, a bunch of references to other things. So in the first room, we can see that Sixth Street have come to the stadium to pick up some gear. We may have to fight some members of their ranks and make sure not to miss the terminal around to the left. On this, we can learn that a recent drop with gear for the terrorists got clipped, and this may in fact be the same drop that was hit by Jason Foreman's crew, since that's the only one I know of that wasn't part of a scav or VDB deal. Also here is a blacklist of clients bar guests don't sell to, though I don't believe any of these are people we can meet. After this room, we'll come to the main factory area, and there's quite a lot of details in here, as well as both more Sixth Street and bar guest. In fact, on one of the six streeters, Frank Osmani, there's a howl to negotiate a business deal chart, suggesting to always start high, never show weakness, and be respectful. Something he doesn't entirely seem to be displaying in his archived convo with bar guest soldier Russell Bora. Now, whilst the bomb in the center is our target, make sure to pick up as well the Hercules AR in the warehouse bits out back. This thing does some insane poison damage, and when poisoned enemies die, they leave behind a damaging pool of acids. I'll rank it alongside the other ARs soon. On the laptop next to it, we can learn that this weapon hasn't actually been released to the public yet, because it's simply too poisonous to anyone in the vicinity, and manufacturing it even has produced a ton of hazardous waste, barrels of which were sent to Ross Ulmer, who wasn't too happy to be instructed to dispose of them outside Dogtown. Ulmer, again, is the boss of the Longshore Stacks criminal activity, and his hideout does indeed exit into West Winter State, the same exit that Leon Rindy used in order to get to the Scav Hotel. Back to the Hercules though, and apparently these guys were also working on a special Kang Tao scope, but sold it off to some paranoid KGB spy, who I'm gonna guess might be Mikhail Akulov, a prominent member of that organization who visits Kabuki and a focal point of a couple gigs over there. Wouldn't be surprised to know he dealt with Dogtown too. On a laptop in the center is a message direct from Crimson Harvest themselves requesting the net nuke in the first place, and the fact that this is ordered on a tight deadline suggests these guys aren't the best planners in the world. Also though, there are a couple orders for some really cool sounding weapons, a Nightcrawler sniper rifle and Hellfire flamethrower, neither of which we can acquire in game sadly, and that's all there is to see out here. Heading into the central chamber then, and uploading the virus, Johnny of course has strong opinions on this terrorist who's grown a conscience, saying it's because of people like her that his anti-corp movements continues to fail. I don't know mate, personally I think you're a Nobu 
Taboos destroy them from within tactic is realistically a more effective way to do it with less collateral damage, but honestly, it's just tough to convince the masses to destroy something corrupt when its existence is just so damn convenient to most of them. In Johnny's view though, this is a war and innocents do get caught in the crossfire, but in the end we can raise the excellent points that he was also at Arasaka Tower for the very personal reason of trying to rescue alts. Certainly not the total paragon of freedom he's proclaiming to be here at any rate. Anyway, with this done it's time to leave the factory, met with more resistance if not done stealthily, and Nell will be waiting in a car down behind Heavy Hearts. Handing over the shard then, and there's one final choice to make, due to the arrival of four Biotechnica agents to arrest Nell. Turns out she'd previously organised a bombing in Paris which had killed 32 innocent people. This whole gig was her acting out of remorse for her actions, not knowing that they'd wind up in civilian deaths. Our choice, on the one hand we can give her to Biotechnica, use our bomb disarming shard to demonstrate our own innocence and walk free, Nell will no doubt die this way and I believe her body is discoverable due to the existence of this shard, which is her briefing for the attack and found on her body, though wherever that's discovered I haven't found it yet, and nor seemingly has anyone else, so please comment below if you know where she turns up. On the other hand, we can take out these agents with extreme ease, hand Nell her shard and send her on her merry way. On one of the agents we can read they were commissioned by someone named Linda Sherman to arrest both us and Linda. A while later, in this scenario, we'll receive an ominous text from Nell saying she's come back to Dogtown, yeah right, and wants to meet, directing us to a blue shipping container that she's hiding inside, and lo and behold, it is a trap and we're jumped by a group of afterlife mercs who were unfortunately hired to just come and die. On one, named Miriam Levy, is another message from Linda Sherman who sent the Biotechnica goons. It would seem they'd gotten a hold of Nell's number and her contacts pertaining to be her to bait us, no doubt in revenge for killing her people. And despite these guys being afterlife affiliated, they'd seemingly never heard of us. If they had, I'd wager they'd turn and run. On another, it's clear Miriam did go to a bit of trouble to put together this crew, but all that really meant was marching even more people to their deaths. But what does this mean for the ultimate fate of Nell? Probably nothing good. If they got a hold of her phone, then they probably got a hold of her. So much for a fresh start, but maybe we can hope that she simply got hacked, surviving the ordeal after all. That is, if she deserves to. I mean, she did kill 32 innocent people, but did go to great lengths to prevent that from happening again. So ultimately, that's up to you to decide, but I personally would say let her go, and probably award this gig another S tier. Once this is done, Mr. Hands will text for one final meet, thanking us for our diligent work and rewarding us with the Quadra R7 Sterling, a car I reviewed in the Phantom Liberty edition of all vehicles ranked. Now, looking back on all nine of those gigs, every single one forces you to question the morality of your decisions, and not one, I would say, has a singularly good outcome, save perhaps for killing Dodger and letting Alan Noel complete his assignment. Overall, they're a huge step up from most of the gigs in the base game, and it's very exciting to consider what they'll be cooking up for Orion. This is the longest video I've ever made by far, and that's purely down to the quality, detail, and all the little references they put in for us to find. As always, a massive thanks to the supporters over on Patreon. They afford me the freedom with my time to make bigger, riskier videos like this, and also go join my new Discord if you want to chat more about this sort of stuff or share suggestions. And finally, thank you for watching this almost feature-length mammoth video. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you in the next one.